Yeah, I think bringing Rose to this tournament, you are very happy to see those numbers of Soltai Ultimatum up at the top of the field. What you really don't want to be seeing is right under it, mono red aggro, mono white aggro. Those are not the decks you want to be seeing if you're bringing Rose to this type of tournament. Let's take a look here at the opening hand of Austin Bursovic. She's got the Rune Crab as well as two Eliminates, which don't really do all too much against Dan Sivka. Let's take a look at his hand, Valky, God of Lies, Shadows Verdict, and Kiora, best of Sea God in the hand here, as well as Owen's Epiphany. This is also not the best looking hand you want to see. Typically, this deck is looking for ramp, ramp, and more ramp. Exactly, and notably, you really do not want to be drawing Valky or Cure Best the Sea God. Those are two of your primary pieces in your Merchant Ultimatum packages. So having both in your opening hand, especially against a deck like Rogues, where you don't expect them to resolve as seven mana cards, is essentially already a mulligan to five. So very natural mulligan from Stan there. Yeah, it takes a better look there, and a mulligan from Austin as well finds... A lot more of a proactive hand, and I think he'll be happier to keep this. Yeah, exactly. I think the same applied to Austin's hand. Eliminate uh, virtually zero targets against Dan's deck, maybe a few bird or cat tokens. So a double eliminate hand, also a mulligan to five, and I think really reasonable mulligans from both players at this point. It looks like both players are happy and ready to get underway here. So let's start things off with a triumph down on the battlefield, drown in the lock. An important pickup here for Austin. Now we just need to get cards into Stan's bin. Yeah, Stan's hand does have a bit of early... Uh card selection with that omen of the sea but part of the problem with it right now is there's no ramp and austin has quite a fast hand stan has that one copy of eliminate to maybe slow things down from austin but still with this type of draw austin can certainly just overload stan and just end the game before stan is able to put anything together leaves guild enforcer on the stack at the end step here stan sifka has the answer and eliminate if he decides to get rid of it now, but no real threat by itself. It's when they start multiplying that uh, rogues become a problem. Yeah, he could certainly save that eliminate, maybe make Austin take the first move, whether it's another Thieves Guild Enforcer here, which it very likely will be, considering Austin doesn't have another land uh, to do anything. But I think Stan may just go for Omen of the Sea on this end step and try to fix that draw, maybe find a Cultivate or a Wolf Willow Haven and smooth out this draw as much as possible. Omen of the Sea, let's see what we find for Stan Sifka. Can he get some of those ramp spells? Finds a forest and a second Thieves Guild Enforcer will join the fray. Yeah, this is good timing from Austin, getting the Thieves Guild Enforcer in before Stan is able to essentially respond to it with a removal spell on the first one, maximizing the amount of mill that you get. Uh, for Stan, none of these mills really matter, except for Polukronos. That is the card that he wants to see go in the graveyard. It is the most important card in this matchup from the Sultai Ultimatum deck's point of view, and if he can get it in there soon enough to a point where he can survive and escape it, he may have a shot. But this is the type of draw the Stan really doesn't want from Austin. It's not very reactive. It is quite aggressive. Multiple Thieves Guild Enforcers with a Soaring Thought Thief as a follow-up means that Stan isn't doing enough to keep up with this draw at the moment. Temple of Melody down on the grave here. As we just see Austin taking a look in the graveyard, getting a counter of the cards. Six cards in the bin. Here's the Eliminate on one of these Thieves Guild Enforcers. And did draw the into the story and has now found a second, but hasn't yet found lands three or four yet. So a little bit of a clunky start here for Austin. He's going to have to find some lands back to back very quickly. Yes and no. Austin is not on the back foot right now, so getting to into the story, not the biggest deal. He's closing this game out in two turns as things stand, and he has his Drown in the Lock as a hard counter, more or less, at this point. For the first play the Stan Sifka makes, Stan is already at six, facing down six damage. The best he can do is play Yorian, and I think with this Drown in the Lock, this game is just over, assuming he even found a land. He does find a land, and it looks like we are going to go towards the big old Sky Noodle. But as you said, Drown in the Lock is going to quickly dispatch of that, and Austin has a lethal in very quick succession in this first game here between these two players. Yeah, really just dispatching the Orient and <laughs> dispatching of the game here uh, from Stan Sivka. Is, it, this is how the matchup tends to go a lot of the time for 
the rogues deck against Sultai Ultimatum, and it is part of the cost that Stansifka is paying by bringing a deck that is more tuned for the mirror. You don't have those Elspeth's Nightmares. You have a main deck copy of a card like Duress, so you can just get overrun by these fast draws from Austin. So it, just unfortunately for Stansifka, that's the nature of the matchup, and uh, we see it play out exactly as Austin wants in game one. All right, well, let's take a look at the sideboarding decisions here as the players make them. What does Stan have to combat this super aggressive start that we've seen from Austin? Really importantly, a second copy of Pelucranos is going to be massive, as well as those three copies of Elder Gargaroth. Those are great for the mid game if you're able to get past that initial push. How you do that is the three copies of Eliminate that we see in the sideboard. Those are going to be great for just making sure that we don't see that one, two, three curve that Austin had in that game from Stan's point of view. Because once you're able to get to those Elder Gargaroths and those Pelucranos and try to stabilize that mid game, that is one that bridges you towards your late game. I think something that we see players do sometimes in this matchup from the Sultai Ultimatum's point of view is completely bored out of Emergent Ultimatum. You take out all your combo pieces, the Cure, Best of Sea God, the Voran Clex, uh, the Valky in a lot of situations, although it's perfectly fine as a two-mana creature play that can disrupt your opponent's draw, and instead just say that I'm going to be able to overpower you with cards like Elder Gargaroth and Pulukronos. I don't need these seven mana plays in my deck that just walk directly into your counter spells. Yeah, and that's one thing that these uh, rogue decks are so good at is, you know, just playing their things at instant speed, not having to worry about doing too much on their own turn, and then holding up that counter magic for the big threats. So I, I like what Stan's doing here, taking out some of those heavier or the more cost-intensive cost spells to be able to keep up with uh, Austin Bursevich. Yeah, surprisingly, Stan did end up leaving in his Emergent Ultimatums, even though he boarded out the Vorinclex and Cure Best the Sea God. So it kind of going halfway there, and we'll see if that ends up coming back to reward him or punish, as drawing those seven mana cards can be extremely <laughs> problematic. Did you see that first hand there from Stan? It was all lands. For that fraction of a second, I did. Uh, for Austin's side of things, it's pretty straightforward. One of the most notable cards he boards out is Ruin Crab in this matchup. Mm -hmm. Notably, one, because he's playing against an 80-card deck, so milling your opponent out not very realistic, but two, when your opponent has two copies of Polyphonos post board, milling them to it is a real liability for you. So taking out some of your turbo mill plan in order to make it harder for your opponent to find that Polyphonos in that game is a big part of Austin's path to success when it comes to this type of post board game. So it's very much more of a tempo game than it is of a, I'm going to try and mill you as quick as I can. Exactly. Your creatures are still going to snowball quite well. They're still going to get the damage done in terms of what you're looking for. You don't need the extra mill that Ruin Crab provides because you're still going to get to seven, eight cards in your opponent's graveyard at a good pace, which will enable all of your rogue synergies as well as that into the story's reduced cost. So interesting decision here on turn two for Austin as he decides whether or not he wants to flash in the Soaring Thought Thief or just get the Thieves Guild Enforcer down along with the Merfolk Wind Robber. Milling quite a few cards indeed there as uh, we get that graveyard nice and full. On the other side of things, Stan just sending Behold the Multiverse into exile and we'll be able to cast that at a later stage for cheaper. Yeah, Soaring Thought Thief... It plays worse into a single removal spell, which is perhaps why we see Austin opt for the two creatures instead. Now, if Stan has a single removal spell, Austin will still have a rogue to attack with on the next turn with that Soaring Thought Thief. He doesn't have a reactive hand at the moment, no counter spells, so nothing that he really wants to be leaving up. And because Stan isn't wrapping, Austin shouldn't be too worried about potentially a Shadow's Verdict coming down on the very next turn, so he'll likely want Want to maximize pressure in this position. Of one mind drawn off the top here for Austin, able to pay that for just one mana if he so chooses. Let's see how he approaches this turn. Yeah, Austin did already have three mana worth of plays with that Soul Guide Lantern and the Soaring Thought Thief, but of one mind, just the perfect draw here as it 
enables him to have the full turn he's looking for while also trying to see if he can draw more options whether it's a counter spell or something like a duress to get a peek at stan's hand if austin gets rid of this shadows verdict that is in stan sifka's hand and is able to continue putting on pressure at the moment there's not much happening over on the other side of the board unfortunately he doesn't find what he's looking for at the top of the library just gets two more lands so he's gonna have to keep digging to find some hand disruption or counter spells to prevent Shadow's Verdict from coming down in a couple of turns time. Yeah, I think right now for Austin, maybe thinking about uh, playing the Soaring Thought Thief at Sorcery Speed just to make sure that he gets the mill trigger and gets Stan to eight cards in the graveyard. Uh, if he hadn't done so, and if he made this attack without there being eight cards in Stan Sifka's graveyard, that copy of Shark Typhoon making a 1-1 token would have been able to trade with the Thieves Guild Enforcer. Still offering the trade here with the Merfolk Wind Robber, but if Austin doesn't want to take that trade, he now has the option of cashing in this Wind Robber, which I think he should be in the market for, considering his Hand is not very good, and this 1-1 one, one token isn't doing much against the remaining board of a 4-2 and a 2-3. So it, I think from Austin's point of view, he's more interested in a card here than getting this shark off the board for Stan Sivka. Yeah, the shark's certainly not the uh, biggest threat here. Taking a long, hard think about it, though. From Austin's point of view, essentially taking this trade means that he's going to be dealing an additional four damage to Stan Sivka on the next turn. So what he's thinking about is, is another card from my point of view worth four damage or not here? Hey, that land definitely not worth four damage, <laughs> but hey, I think it's very reasonable when put in that position to make that decision, considering so many cards in your deck will be good there. And again, as you're approaching that fifth turn, that fourth turn where Extinction Event, Shadow's Verdict have to be on the mind, uh, mm -hmm. for Austin, these are the types of decisions that he needs to be thinking about. Can I get away with just taking this trade and hoping my draw works out? Stan Sifka got a full look at Austin's hand and has seen now that it's all lands, barring the Soul Guide Lantern, which he's sent into the graveyard. So he's going to be feeling a little bit more comfortable knowing that there's no immediate answer to the Shadow's Verdict in hand, but still, Austin is flying in with a bunch of damage from these two creatures, but as you mentioned, that the Shark is still there and can prevent some of that damage from coming through. Yeah, I certainly would not put Stan in the region Oof. of comfortable until this Shadow's Verdict resolves. Once it does, I think he is going to be feeling really good about the prospects of this game. And unfortunately for Austin, just another land off the top means that whether Stan knows it or not, that Shadow's Verdict will be resolving. Sorry, Thought Thief triggers once again. Couple lands into the graveyard there. Shark's going to jump in the way of the Thieves Guild Enforcer, preventing four points of damage. Down to 11 goes Stan. Holding up two blue mana, always suspicious. And Temple of Deceit is going to scry. And there's a Drown in the Lock. Just one card too late. Yeah, Austin not going to pass up on the hard counter, but is going to feel the pain of it being too late. And now he delivers the good news to Stan. The coast is clear. There is no counter spell. Just putting Luris in hand means that Stan Sivka will be able to resolve this Shadow's Oof. Verdict and have some excellent follow-up as well. Oh my goodness. Elder Gargaroth, talk about excellent indeed. Luckily, Austin will have an answer for that, but there is a mystical dispute to protect whatever threat is played next turn from Stan Sifka if we find that land. But there go all the creatures, and poor little Lurus has nothing to play with in the graveyard, barring a Soul Guide Lantern. Yeah, Soul Guide Lantern's still not the worst thing to bring back. Uh, this land would be coming into play tapped if Austin was to play it here, so it, he could play Lurus and leave up Drown in the Loch right now if he so chooses just to get another creature on the board. Uh, however, if his plan is to potentially play around something like exactly Mystical Dispute and the Threat, that he may not want to deploy Lurus and just pass with Drown this turn. So we'll, we'll see what Austin chooses to do. I think it's too tempting from his position to continue playing the tempo game as the more time you give Soltai Ultimatum, the more likely it is for them to get back in the game. And an untapped land from Stan Sivka here means Elder Gargaroth with Mystical Dispute backup is now in the cards and 
Stan knows that there's one unknown card in Austin's hand. So even if that card is a hard counter, this mystical dispute is able to deal with it. So it, I think Stan Sifka, from his point of view, should know the coast is clear to just resolve Elder Gargaroth if he wants to. Eliminate takes care of Lurus. Wonder if Stan Sifko is just trying to get a gauge of what's in the hand. There's like, what you got there, Austin? Anything you want to uh, put on the stack here, perhaps? Yeah, this is a safer play. It means that Austin isn't able to have full mana to potentially play the Soul Guide Lantern next turn. I think Stan really trying to leverage the fact that Austin's draw is a bit awkward and Stan is fully aware of that fact. So perhaps just wanting to make sure not to walk into that awkward draw. Oh, into the story, a very good pickup here for Austin. If he can get it to resolve, he'll be able to refill his hand essentially and try and look for some more ways to interact with Stan Sifka's board. Of which there isn't one yet, but just give it a second and uh, some crazy things are going to start happening here. Yeah, it's Elder Gargaroth time. Now we see Stan once the board is clear, making the play uh, that was available to him last turn. And for Austin, it, he has to choose whether he wants to uh, answer this Gargaroth or lead off with Into the Story and then use the Drown Lock to protect that as a potential option after the fact. So opts to not drown in the lock the Elder Gargaroth and step into the story with drown in the lock back up. Yeah, this is Let's going to be the risky moment. Yeah. If Austin goes for into the story and Stan responds with mystical dispute, which he very likely will, then from Austin's point of view, does he counter the mystical dispute and hope he draws an answer to the Gargaroth in the four cards from into the story, or does he just remove Elder Gargaroth using uh, the Drown Lock? The other option is just kill the Gargaroth now, untap, play your seventh land, and then into the story can resolve through Mystical Dispute, which is what I think Austin is considering now. Can he take the less tempo-oriented play in order to try to uh, maximize his ability to play around uh, mystical dispute exactly the only card represented by Stan Sivka there ups to go for the into the story on the end step with the counter spell backup and draws cards but none of these deal with the problem of the big old Elder Gargaroth on the battlefield but there is Heartless Act finds a way to deal with it and is still able to keep up a mystical dispute yeah cards was a really good definition of what had come to Austin before that Heartless Act was drawn off the off, the off one mind. <laughs> and fortunately, Stan has scryed to the top, so he knows that Duress is there, that can clear the way for this Alrin's Epiphany, uh, get rid of that mystical dispute. No point in discarding the Clink to Dust. So it, Stan does have a window here to cast Alrin's Epiphany, take an extra turn, and try to draw something that he can resolve while he knows the shields are down from Austin here. In response, we're going to see Soaring Thought Thief hit the battlefield. There are the two ravens from Elrond's Epiphany, and Stan Sivka gets to take another turn with Behold the Multiverse off the top of the library. Behold, not the worst draw here. Suddenly, two new cards. Stan would have preferred something uh, bigger, if possible, but... As the situation stands, getting to scry and find something useful like that Pelucranos, pretty huge here. Notably, Stan actually does not have the mana to cast Emergent Ultimatum. He does have seven lands, but three of them are blue, and Emergent Ultimatum has a very specific casting cost. So even though he has seven lands, Emergent Ultimatum not in the cards yet, but I don't think Stan is complaining having found a copy of the most important card in the matchup in Pelucranos. Yeah, it's just a matter of time before he finds his correct mana for the Emergent Ultimatum. Polychronos is a great pickup as well against this deck as uh, Cling to Dust is going to get to work on the graveyard, getting rid of the other copy. Yeah, so luckily for Austin, he did get a mill with the Soaring Thought Thief that hit the second copy of Polychronos, the only two copies in the deck. So it, a window for Austin there to cling to dust that one. However... He does not know the bad news that there is a second copy sitting in Stan Sifka's hand just waiting to come out. And unless oh Austin draws some sort of removal, uh, that Pelucranos is going to uh, be safe on the board when Stan eventually chooses to deploy it. 
Oh, it's emergent ultimatum time. Here we go. Our first one of many this weekend, I'm sure. Let's see what Stan Sifka presents to Austin, and let's see what Austin sends back. Now, notably, Stan has taken out the Cure, Best of Sea God, and the Vorinclex, so some mm -hmm. of the typical piles are gone. I wouldn't be surprised to see a pile that is something like Valky, Shadow's Verdict, Alrin's Epiphany, uh, Instead, going for Valky, Elder Gargaroth, Alrin's Epiphany, really just trying to make sure that if Austin doesn't want to give him two very game-defining or game-changing cards here, he's going to give him one plus an extra turn, and that would give him plenty of time to then play this Pelucano, start clearing down this board. So really, Emergent Ultimatum, a risky card in this matchup. It's a seven-mana blue card that can easily get Mystical Dispute in addition to every counter and discard spell in the Rogue deck. But when you maneuver the board to this position where it can resolve, it is ridiculously powerful. And <laughs> Austin holding a hand of two lands that Stan Sifka knows about knows yeah. that this game is quickly slipping away from him. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't even know what to pick here. At this point, it's just like, all right, let's go to game number three. So... <sighs> We, I mean, yeah, what, what's the best option here for, for Austin? I, I think putting, putting the Valky back is the most reasonable one. Planeswalker is not a card type that is easily answered by the Rogues deck outside mm -hmm. of your creatures. And you know that those birds are there waiting in the wings to try to block <laughs> the creatures for the time necessary. Uh, Elder Gargaroth, at least Austin has some redraws to a potential Heartless Act to get rid of it. Uh, we do see that Castle Lothrain in, in on the battlefield, as well as a Merfolk Wind Robber. So it... In the next turn Austin gets after another turn from Stan Sivka, he would have had a potential three looks, uh, maybe even four if he uses the Cling to Dust to try to find a Heartless Act. So the opportunity was there to maybe try to answer this Gargaroth before it takes over the game too hard. But Elder Gargaroth, just such a good creature against Rogue's Vigilance plus Reach and getting the ability on both attacking and blocking means that this card just completely shuts down the entire game plan from the Demir Rogues deck until they remove it from the battlefield. And Skyclave Shade, great attacker, but not able to block, <laughs> means that Elder Gargaroth can swing on through unimpeded here. Yep, and he's going to get to do just that. Decides to make a 3-3 beast. And uh, I'm not sure that Merfolk Wind Robber is going to block here, but I do think Austin might want to dig for some more useful cards because those two lands are not going to cut it. The game is very much slipping away from him at this point, and now with Polokranos joining the battlefield, it's going to be incredibly difficult to come back from this for Austin. Yeah, this is a heartbreaking play here uh, when Austin sees this Pelucranos come down, knowing that he had already gotten rid of the other one. The odds of Stan having this card in hand were quite low. So when it comes down, just not at all what Austin wants to see. And this is just going from bad to worse here. Agadim's Awakening. Okay, what do we got in the bin? Let's take a look. How many creatures can we get back? Lurus, Soaring Thought Thief. Is there a one drop in there? There's no one drop, so Agadim is awaiting. Can get a one drop by sacrificing mm -hmm. the Merfolk Wind Robber here. Get the full value of the three creatures when casting it for six, and then you would still be able to follow that up with the Soul Guide Lantern out of the graveyard, take Solaris, or just replaying the Merfolk Wind Robber after sacrificing yeah. it again. So, possibly one of the best draws for Austin. Uh, arguably into the story would have been better as it would have given him more looks to try to find an answer to this Elder Gargaroth. But considering there's very few cards in his deck at this point that would have been good, Agadim's Awakening is in the top percentage of draws. Yeah. It's at least something to keep him in the game another turn at least. As we see the three creatures being selected, Lurus, the Soaring Thought Thief, and the Merfolk Wind Robber will return to the battlefield and the Soul Guide Lantern will be available to play. Notably for Austin, if he chooses to sacrifice the Merfolk Wind Robber here to try mm -hmm. to replay it with Loris rather than play Lantern, that would give Stan Sifka a window to activate Pelucranos and destroy the Loris before Austin is actually able to cast the card off of it. So I think that is certainly part of the decision-making process for why he wants to do it this way. The other reason is you just want to get the Soul Guide Lantern down on the battlefield in case you need it. You may not, but considering you can't leave up Clink to Dust, 
should stand playing away where this Pelucranos goes to the graveyard and gives Austin a window to remove it before escaping it, uh, that would be disastrous for Stan Sivka as this Pelucranos is still a very important part of the game plan here. Sure. Wolf Willow Haven is the draw for Stan Sivka. Does have Yorian Skynome at in hand. Can't bounce Polycranos and reset him, which is kind of fun. Yeah, I think that's actually definitely going to be the game plan here from Austin, for, from Stan. First, get rid of the Loris. No lifelink because Pelucranos does prevent the damage actually dealt to it. So, it, unfortunately, the bonus life that Austin may have been hoping to gain, not quite there. Once again, the way is clear for Elder Gargoroth to attack in, as well as the Beast. Rogues doesn't really deal well with boards that are going wide. They do have access to Crippling Fear now, thanks to Kaldheim, but mm -hmm. that's not a card they're built boarding in in the Sultai Ultimatum matchup, so Force Stan just continuing to go wide, knowing that this is the way that he overpowers this rogue sec now. Yeah, certainly not something that you'd expect to die from, um, you know, generally against an Ultimatum deck is just a, a, a mass of creatures that you can do nothing against. It's like, wait, wait a second, I'm the creature deck, what are you doing? Turns out they got some game. Post board. Yeah. And a Siorian time. Oh yeah. Here comes the good old Sky Noodle. Yeah, Austin's in desperation mode. Lantern tries to cycle for a card, does have a removal spell now to deal with this Elder Gargaroth should he choose to do so, but that is no longer the only problem. The Gargaroth has gotten the job done, and every card on the other side of the board is now problematic from Stansifka. All right, two removal spells, though. That's got to be worth something, right? Definitely worth something. What Austin does have access to do with the 10 mana available to him now is destroy the Pelucranos, destroy the Elder Gargaroth, cling to dust the Pelucranos before Stan is able to escape it, and still play the Merfolk Wind Robber. So it cleans up the board quite a bit, but he's still going to be facing down uh, this Soaring Thought, uh, facing down this Yorian, facing down these 3 3 beasts. So still problematic uh, from what Stan Sivka is presenting. And so it goes in for an attack here with the Skyclave Shade. As you mentioned, it's a pretty terrible blocker, i.e. it can't at all. So getting in there, clearing out one of these pigeons in the sky. And now what does Austin do with the rest of his turn here? I, I think giving Stan the opportunity to untap may be tempting just because you can respond to a Pelucranos activation with that Drown Lock. However, if Stan draws something like a Negate when you give him that opportunity, it's going to be disastrous. So it, as much as he wants to bait Stan into using his mana, I think from Austin's point of view, you can't afford to let that happen. And yeah, this Clean to Dust follow-up is necessary as again, once that Pelucranos escapes, the game is more or less over on the spot from Austin's point of view. Gains three life here going up to 11 and does have two blockers for the attackers the Sansifka is presenting. But if Stan draws anything here, it's really problematic for Austin. Well, from Austin's perspective, possibly the best thing that Stan could have drawn as a duress, looking at nothing but a Fabled Passage in hand. As we first things first go to attacks, we're going to see some blocks tendered here. Taking six, Merfolk Windrub is going to jump in the way like the valiant little friend that he is and draws another land for Austin, who's not going to be happy about that. Stan very cleverly waiting until turn the second main phase to take a look in the hand. Sees only lands, and you got to think he's feeling a lot better about that. Going to sacrifice the Wolf of Heaven and get a wolf on the board. But into the story, drawn off the top here for Austin. This is probably the best thing he could have found almost certainly part of uh the game plan now for austin is just try to survive while forcing stan to throw away creatures to the skyclave shade uh that's Ooh, boy. Continued card advantage, exactly what he's looking for. Thieves Guild Enforcer going to be a solid blocker. And Austin still has a healthy life total, plus access to that Clink to Dust to try to gain more life. So this is Austin potentially uh, turning the corner on this yeah. game, still in a rough position, but has the tools to maybe put up a fight here. It does indeed. Like you mentioned, Thieves Guild Enforcer, a good blocker, will be able to take care of one of these bigger creatures the three threes we got the soaring thought thief to deal with yorion for the time being tempting this... to go for an into the story to find a removal spell or 
not really at this I don't point. think you can at this life total. I, I think this mm -hmm. is an interesting position because as it stands, Stan is looking at Austin's life total of five, and he has those uh, five creatures on the battlefield. Even if the Thought Thief blocks, let's say, Yorian, and Austin goes for a clink to dust on a creature, Stan mm -hmm. would still have lethal. So Austin may be able to uh, try to bait Stan into an attack here and surprise him with the Thieves Guild Enforcer. Unfortunately, the problem is is even if Thieves Guild Enforcer blocks a beast, uh, Soaring Thought Thief will still need to block Yorian in order for Cling to Dust to keep Austin alive. So this is going to be a lot of treading water here from Austin yeah. if he goes for a survival route. So taking a long time on this decision is Austin just figuring out how he wins this and not just lose slower. Yeah, Merfolk Wind Robber is really the reason to go for an into the story here at mm -hmm. Sorcery Speed, uh, just because you do not have many uh, creatures left that don't have flash in your deck. I believe you've already used two copies of Wind Robber in this game, so only the two copies of Wind Robber are left. All the other creatures, all the other removal spells are instant speed, so giving yourself Oof. more options here is always a good thing. Now the duress off the top here. And a decision needs to be made for Austin. Is he happy to see this into the story go? Is he going to fire it off and hope that there's an instant speed piece of removal to keep him alive? If he fires it off and misses, he loses the game on the spot. Yeah. Perhaps it's worth it realizing what he has access to isn't getting the job done anyways. And you may just need to forego the cling to dust and hope you find it. Austin doing the math on what is left. We see three copies of Dranenloch already gone. So what is he hoping to draw? We have more Soaring Thought Thieves. There's Heartless Axe potentially. And yeah, just needs to fire it off and hope he finds something. Oh, Disdainful Stroke isn't going to cut it, unfortunately. The rest will see the only spell available in Austin's hand, and all Stan's got to do is it. just keep, keep swinging. This is lethal. Stan Sivka has full information on Austin's hand. He's doing the math right now. If he attacks with everything, that will be lethal damage coming through, and Austin has no redraws, no way of finding a card. Triple checking the math there for Stan Sivka, just making sure, okay, Yorian gets blocked, a beast gets blocked, five damage gets through, that's fine. Doesn't even need to attack with the bird to represent lethal. Can <laughs> do it anyways, because it is over here. No blocks there from Austin. He knows the writing's on the wall. And we are going to go to a game three between Stan Sivka and Austin Bursevich. All right. Any slight difference to the sideboard going into game three? I think Austin may consider bringing in that third copy of, or second copy of Mystical Dispute, sorry, now that he's seen the Stan is kept in uh, Emergent Ultimatum. Uh, typically, again, that's a card you expect Sulfide X to be boarding out in the matchup. However, because Stan has shown that he's kept it in, it may be the type of card that Austin is now interested in. The one reason he may hesitate on that is because Austin is now on the play, his entire game plan should be trying trying to end the game uh, and put on that tempo. One of the surprising things I'm seeing here is Austin has his fourth copy of Skyclave Shade sitting in the sideboard, only interested in bringing in three for this matchup, uh, which I think is quite an interesting choice from his position, especially on the play here, as he is perhaps being a bit too reactive rather than wanting the full aggressive package here against this Emergent Ultimatum Sultai deck. I mean, typically what you would see being on the play in game three is, all right, I'm going to go back to my initial game plan where I just try and out-tempo you, counter your uh, relevant spells, kill whatever's on the battlefield in front of me, and then I just kill you with damage. I'm not too fussed about the mill plan, or is he... He's, re he's returning to that with the crabs, which are now going out again. So what's what's that decision process? I, I think he's just thinking whether the crabs can put on more pressure here uh, to perhaps enable an aggressive start with those Thieves Guild Enforcers and the Merfolk Wind Robbers. I think he himself realizes that's not really what the matchup is about. He is thinking about it. He has the time to do so. Still 30 seconds on the clock to consider all his options in an event like the Caltime Championship. You don't really want to be autopiloting these decisions. You want to take the time to think it through and make sure that the plan you're 
going into game three with is the best one you can present, especially in this type of matchup that is favored for you. You don't want to be giving your opponent the opportunity to get a free win because you've made a mistake in sideboarding. One thing that I enjoyed from the uh, player questionnaires was that uh, Austin describes his play style as I'm a feel player. I play off my instincts and prefers playing a deck with strong cards. So I always ends up playing the best deck or a controlling deck. So I can I can see and you know where we've seen him play previously, you can see that he, he agonizes over these decisions and he gets very invested in the games that he's playing. So, you know, it might not always be the correct decision based off of the statistics or everything, but it's what he feels is correct to do in certain situations. So let's see how those feelings pay off here. Yeah, no matter what, it's always a decision that is well thought out, even if it may get to the wrong result. Austin, you can certainly see him going through the process of thinking things through. And I, I think that is definitely one of the reasons that he's been so successful over the past few years. We've seen him putting up result after result uh, leading up to earning an invite to this Rivals League, thanks to his victory in the uh, Grand Finals uh, yep. of 2020. And this draw from him, not the best, but not the worst. Uh, part of the problem is he doesn't really have any mill going. So into the story, not likely to have a reduced cost anytime soon. And Stan having an answer for that sorry Thought Thief is pretty problematic. Yes, yeah, so now we're playing at Sorcery Speed, making sure that we can resolve things while Stan Sifka is tapped out. Did have the answer for the Soaring Thought Thief in the Heartless Act, but uh, doesn't have any further removal, just has that copy of Mystical Dispute, so still haven't seen any ramp from Stan Sifka. Where's Where are the Wolf Willow Havens hiding out? Most of them got boarded out. Stan not overly interested in ramping in this matchup as much as mm -hmm. he is having high quality cards. Again, that sometimes is usually accompanied with boarding out the Emergent Ultimatum package, uh, but these Ultimatums don't get cast as quickly in this matchup. As we see, Stan is very much interested in stabilizing the game, stabilizing the board, and once things are safe, that's when the ultimatum comes out. And here, I think Stan, thinking about what do I need to be worried about? Should I take this turn to just foretell and leave up dispute or just put Yorian in my hand, considering my opponent has no creatures on the battlefield, I don't need to really play around anything representing a counterspell yet here. That's exactly what he does. Yorian Sky Nomad out of the companion zone into Stan Sifka's hand and happy to pass the turn back. Tapped out. Skyclave Shade drawn off the top here for Austin. Yeah, Skyclave Shade, one of the better draws here as it can allow Austin to start putting on pressure, but again, not providing any mill. So this into the story is still looking like it's going to be full cost. And with only one card in Stan Sifka's graveyard right now, the Stranaloch essentially is a textless card at the moment. So <laughs> unfortunately for Austin, his game plan isn't quite rolling yet. And you need it to be rolling in this matchup against a deck like Soltai Ultimatum. The clock is ticking for Austin. It certainly is, as there aren't many options available to Austin at this point. Could go cling to dust and try and draw another card. Or we're going to Temple of Deceit first and foremost, find another Drown in the Lock, which isn't very useful at this moment has to find those creatures and get this mill plan going to make those effective. Yeah, really looking for a Thieves Guild Enforcer here is at least when it resolves, it guaranteed gives you some mill, even if it doesn't get to attack. Uh, but Austin, uh, something like a didn't say please would actually be perfect in his position <laughs> right now. He, he, he would love a counterspell that would get some mill as well, as that would allow him to feel safe behind what he's doing. Uh, as it stands... Austin actually goes for the Loris. Part of the idea behind that is he wants to get back the Soaring Thought Thief that is in his graveyard that was Heartless acted earlier. He recognizes the need to get some mill in, so the pressure from Skyclay Shade no longer enough at this stage of the game to start dealing three damage when your opponent's at 20 and getting to the point where they can cast their spells. So Austin prioritizing starting that mill train by getting Loris to try to get back the Soaring Thought Thief or maybe the Mur Merfolk Wind Robber here now that he has it, even though he can't sacrifice it for a card quite yet first things first we're going to get a land down on the battlefield and here comes Lurus of the dream den safe from that mystical dispute but the soaring thought thief is not stan sifka didn't hesitate at all there to just fire that off and counter the soaring thought thief there's a cultivate off the top of the library yeah cultivate pretty great 
draw here, all things considered. Obviously, Stan would prefer an answer to what Austin is uh, presenting in that Loris. However, now he does have the option of ramping if he so chooses uh, to try to get that emergent ultimatum down sooner. Instead, we get a very, very sad Yorion Sky Nomad. Nothing to bounce, but importantly, able to jump in the way of his companion counterpart. Yeah, Yorian says that the board right now from Austin is continued to be shut down. And Stan, again, just trying to pace himself. He has a few very strong turns coming up. He mm -hmm. does have that Alrin's Epiphany foretold. So once he casts that for six mana, which he could do next turn, thanks to the Seagate Restoration, offering to be an untapped land, if it resolves, because the only thing Austin has right now is a card that has two cards in the graveyard, uh, if that Alrin's Epiphany resolves, then Stan would know that there isn't really anything happening on Austin's side of the board. And on the extra turn, if he draws an untapped land, it's Emergent Ultimatum time. It is time to go. Yep. So Stan Sifka looking to close out this game very, 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 very quickly here. And Austin not having very much to say about it at all, unfortunately. The draw is just not being kind to him. And it is time to take turns. Yeah, the good news for Austin right now is the only two lands available in Stan Sivka's hand come into play tapped. So mm -hmm. at the moment, Emergent Ultimatum is not a given. Now, Austin does have a redraw available to him with this Cling to Dust. Exile a card, likely from his own graveyard. You don't want to be reducing your opponent's graveyard size at all at this point. Uh, to try to find something like a Negate, like a Mystical Dispute, that's not going to do it. So Stan now has a window, if he draws that untapped land, for Emergent Ultimatum made him to come down. Yorion gets through for four points of damage, down to 16 goes Austin. Seagate Restoration off the top of the library. Does doesn't he do have... It. Doesn't do it. Needs another... Either source. green or black. The third yeah. blue source would not do it there, so unfortunately for Sansifka, finds the seventh on tap land, but <laughs> one of the very few lands in the deck that wouldn't do it for him, and this means Austin is going to get another turn, and with these Soaring Thought Thieves and this uh, Merfolk Wind Robber, going to at least mill for four on an attack, what he can do is play this Thought Thief on the end step, send in just the Merfolk Wind Robber to get that mill for four, mm -hmm. and then sacrifice sacrifice it to draw a card rather than let it get eaten by Yorian. When that happens, suddenly eight cards in the graveyard for San Sifka means Dreadnought Lock is online, Into the Story mm -hmm. is online. Now with another hard counter, <laughs> oh. uh, Austin Burst Savage might be on the turning point of this game. He may be able to turn it around in the next few turns here because Stan Sivka's seven mana spells suddenly don't look so good considering Austin is still a deck that plays a lot of counter spells. Goodness me, what a turn of events here. If that had been just any other land, Stan Sivka would have been so close to wrapping up this game. But now Austin has a chance with two counter spells and into the story and two Soaring Thought Thieves able to fill up that graveyard. Yeah, I think we're going to see it start off with that attack from the Wind Robber. It's going to mill four, draw a card. He can even replay it with Loris mm -hmm. on the second main phase, have another card, and ooh, things are going to start getting out of hand now for Austin. <laughs> this, is, this is the turnaround he needs. All right, there goes the Mofog Wind Robber. Let's get milling. There's an Elder Gargroth on top of Stan Sivka's library, so he's not going to be able to rely on that one this turn. Or this game, I should say. There is another option available to Austin. Attack with all the flying creatures. After the mill happens, just use Dranelok to destroy Yorian yeah. and start getting aggressive. Something that Austin needs to be aware of. There is only five and a half minutes left on his clock. So yeah. if Stan is able to restabilize this board and this game goes long, that could be really bad for Austin, considering he does have a significant clock disadvantage at the moment. Well, we have seen these merfolk or these rogue decks close out games at a rapid pace, and there's Polychronos Unchained. But luckily, we have an answer for that in Austin's hand. It didn't say please or the Drown on the Loch. Yeah, fortunately for Austin, does have the one-two punch of a counter plus cling to dust in the graveyard. Stan not currently at the point with uh, mana to cast it and immediately escape it. Uh, and that's why we maybe see Stan going for Seagate Restoration, but I don't think Austin's going to let Stan draw five new cards here. <laughs> 
You did not say please, even though that was drawn on the lock. It's still fun to say. And uh, no more cards there for Stan Sifka. Only gets to scry. What does he find on the top of the library? It's going to get milled next turn, most likely, but sends it to the bottom anyway, as that's not something he wants to see. Another Soaring Thought Thief. It's go time. Top. Oh, it's 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 100% go time. Let's start killing things. Austin vs. Savage is putting his foot on the gas. Heartless Act takes care of Yorian Sky Nomad. And here we're going to see an attack with... Almost everything. Luris is going to hang back. We don't want to lose the kitty. Never mind. Kitty's I, I getting in on the action. I don't think Luris is hanging back. <laughs> oh, kitty's getting in there. Go, go. Austin is feeling good about this game. He got the turnaround he needed. Uh, even if Stan was to go something like Polucranos next turn and it gets countered and he escapes it, he's just going to die to the Air Force here. So mm -hmm. Austin has <laughs> no problems with Stan just double blocking this Luris. He no longer needs the card advantage that this Luris is providing. Stan even knows he's like, okay, that's a lot of damage coming through here. We've got to mitigate some of this as uh, the two ravens jump in the way of the two flyers. Trade offered there, the Merfolk Wind Robber will be able to be recast with Lurus. Oh, that's such a gross little interaction that just like, oh, would you like another card? Here you go. Could you play me again? Would you like another card? Here you go. So Austin has an interesting decision here. If he doesn't play anything and passes with six mana up, he would be able to play Didn't Say Please on a potential Emergent Ultimatum and pay for a Mystical Dispute. As it stands now, he no longer has that option. So if Stan has a Mystical Dispute, which we know he doesn't, or if he's able to Omen into a Mystical Dispute in response to this Didn't Say Please, which I think is his only option at this point, Austin can no longer pay for it. This was a preventable situation by not playing this wind robber and if stan finds this mystical dispute to punish this didn't say please he could turn this game around oh what does he find it's another emergent ultimatum so he gets away with it this time and scoops him on up austin wins the game